Hello, I'm a special news person, and here's some special news. You may have been hearing a lot about an activist group known as Antifa. Antifa! But who are they? Why are they systematically raising the countryside and burning entire cities to the ground? Are they for fascism or against it? Why not classify Antifa as a terrorist group? Very violent group of protesters that call themselves Antifa. To answer that last question, we must examine their name. Antifa stands for anti-fascist. Anti is a preposition meaning in opposition to, and fascist is a word meaning fascist. Good. But are they really anti-fascist? Or is their name, like inflammable, an oxymoronic word invented by the Illuminati to confuse us into self-immolation? A recent protest and counter-protest at Berkeley has generated some alarming headlines. A Washington Post article retweeted by President Trump described the situation as black-clad Antifa members attack peaceful right-wing demonstrators in Berkeley. There were other alarming headlines as well. Masked anarchists violently rout right-wing demonstrators in Berkeley, claimed an SF gate headline. And PBS reported the disturbing news that black-clad anarchists swarm anti-hate rally in California. Now, if you read these headlines, you get the sense that thousands of angry chaos goblins are attacking peaceful anti-hate protesters for no reason. But that PBS headline is misleading, because Antifa wasn't attacking an anti-hate rally. Rather, they were part of the anti-hate rally protesting a right-wing group called Patriot Prayer. And their rally was called No to Marxism in Berkeley. The news stories I mentioned did very little investigation into this group and its motives. They call them peaceful right-wing protesters and go as far as to say that their leaders consistently denounce racism, which sources are telling me is now somehow a very brave thing to do. Fox News and the Mercury News cited Southern Poverty Law Center, an organization that tracks extremism, as proof that Patriot Prayer isn't categorized as a hate group. Cool. Let's take them completely at their word. No need to actually read the statement the SPLC released about the rally, and oops, too late, I did that. It turns out that SPLC released an article ahead of the Berkeley rally, and the first sentence is, Joey Gibson's Patriot Prayer has trolled the Northwest with a series of rallies designed to provoke violence and populated with extremists. But he says he's changed his approach. They write that Patriot Prayer organizes with the clear intent of attempting to provoke a violent response from far-left anti-fascists. They also point out that Patriot Prayer often shows up with armor and bats and often instigates fights. So they're trolls specifically looking to get into fights with Antifa. But at least they're not racists. I mean, Joey Gibson, Patriot Prayer's leader, openly denounced neo-Nazis. Except, whoops, he's doing a really bad job of it because white supremacists keep showing up to his rallies. And that's exactly what is drawing Antifa to counter-protest. According to the SPLC, white nationalists, skinheads, and other identitarian activists have been involved in all of Gibson's rallies in Portland, though generally without announcing their presence. Interesting that Fox and the other news sources we quoted didn't mention this. Also, they didn't mention that one of these neo-Nazis at Gibson's rallies later attempted to attack a Muslim woman and her friend while shouting racial slurs and ended up killing the two men who came to the women's defense. You might say, well, it's not fair to judge an entire far-right group whose troll of a leader publicly said he disavows neo-Nazis just because a few of them are neo-Nazis and one of them committed a hate crime. But the media is all about judging the entirety of Antifa over the actions of a few and doesn't hesitate to present Patriot Prayer as a completely peaceful, non-racist group. Also, Gibson himself claimed that discriminating against Muslims isn't bigotry, but, you know, he disavowed racism. So... I'm not saying Antifa did no wrong during the Berkeley rally, or that it's good that they're allowing alt-right trolls to bait them into fights. These fights are used to create a false narrative of fringe lefties committing violence, and this false narrative is a historical tool used by fascists, and our media is falling for it like Elmer Fudd in... Wabbit Hell. Using violence, even to counteract violent fascist ideologies, gets into very tricky territory. At what point is it necessary? Is it effective? Does it actually make things better? And if it's not in self-defense, what does it accomplish? In fact, take a look at this clip from the rally. Get out! Get away, you out! Why are you guys beating yourself for? Move! He's A far-right protester runs up to a group of Antifa and pepper sprays them a few times, and Antifa rushes over to knock him down with their shields. The Trump supporter is clearly trying to instigate violent confrontation. But why is he bringing pepper spray to a shield fight? 
Probably because he thinks that once the crowd of angry protesters descend upon him, he'll look like a peaceful, hapless victim. And judging by the way the media interpreted the rally, he was right. And sure, he instigated the altercation, but Antifa gave a disproportionate response, one that isn't justifiable as self-defense. But even if these protesters felt like the pepper sprayer deserved it, they're still giving him the martyrdom and victimhood he was trolling for in the first place. This is a common tactic of the far right and of hate groups. That fun video of a crying Nazi is actually sinister when you think about the intentions. Everybody in their mother wants to f***ing ruin my life, okay? And if, and, if, and if I wanted violence, it's not a difficult thing for a guy like me to find, okay? That dude's not crying. Here's him before the rally. I'm carrying a pistol. I go to the gym all the time. I'm trying to make myself more capable of violence. The amount of restraint that our people showed out there, I think, was astounding. And whatever you think of my opinions, that's going to be something that puts you in danger. I think that a lot more people are going to die before we're done here, frankly. We're that's not right. nonviolent. We'll f***ing kill these people if we have to. And now let's see the tears. Um, so, yeah, there we go. Literally none? Cool. Neo-Nazis like Nazis, want to appear like victims, not only to help recruit their base, but to appeal to the media. They're just rebranding themselves for the mainstream. These aren't your grandmother's Nazis, but they're, they're still Nazis. So even though Antifa can be criticized for some of their methods, the media still has a responsibility to portray the events in an accurate and objective manner. Remember the news stories we just discussed? Probably, it was very, very recently. With headlines like, black-clad Antifa members attack peaceful right-wing demonstrators in Berkeley, and masked anarchists violently rout right-wing demonstrators in Berkeley. Now compare those to the more restrained headlines that preceded the white supremacist rallies in Charlottesville, such as, one dead, 34 injured in clashes at Virginia, or one dead as car strikes crowds amid protests of white nationalists gathering in Charlottesville. These headlines are ambiguous about where the violence is coming from. In fact, they don't even specify who was killed and by whom. It's hand-waved as a clash. But it wasn't a clash that killed Heather Heyer, a young leftist woman who died while protesting the white supremacist rally. It was a car driven by a white supremacist who intentionally drove into the crowd of protesters. And DeAndre Harris didn't get injured amid protests. He was beaten up by white supremacists. Imagine if these stories were written in the style of the post-Berkeley news stories. They'd read something like, White nationalists storm peaceful left-wing protests killing one, or hat and polo-clad neo-Nazis violently attack minorities. It's important to note this lopsidedness in reporting, where Antifa are explicitly labeled and blamed for violence, whereas white supremacists are labeled as victims. This helps contribute to the all-sides narrative. Recently, there was a Washington Post op-ed called, Yes, Antifa is the moral equivalent of neo-Nazis. The author echoed the same lazy reporting that claimed Antifa attacked peace-loving right-wing protesters and equates violence to totalitarianism. Now, just as we examine the word Antifa to arrive at anti-fascist, let's examine fascism and totalitarianism, which are specific political ideologies. Now, fascism is an authoritarian nationalistic government that uses undemocratic force to suppress opposition and control wealth. Totalitarianism describes a government in which there are no balances to power that can have absolute control over all aspects of life. Simply being violent, even though it's valid to argue that it's morally wrong and unproductive, is not the same as being totalitarian. Drinking seven four locos and trying to start a fight with a mailbox while violent and mean to mailboxes isn't totalitarianism. Violent protests aren't fascism, and you can make coherent arguments against violence at protests without forgetting what words mean. Journalists, your name has journal in it, a thing you put a bunch of words in. So maybe you should be more particular about how you use words rather than making up things that sound sort of right. If it feels like the media is devoting as much time criticizing Antifa as they are actual fascists, it's because that's, uh, that's how it is. Fairness and accuracy in reporting, or fair, hey, ha, did a review of op-eds and editorials in the wake of Charlottesville comparing the frequency of criticism of Antifa versus actual fascism. They found 27 opinion pieces denouncing neo-Nazis and white nationalists, and 28 pieces that denounced Antifa. It's as if for every 27 articles about how harmful cancer is, the media felt they had to devote 28 to explain how some people who are fighting cancer are actually assholes. Now, this isn't isolated to news about the Charlottesville protest. Recently, there was another protest in Portland, which the Washington Post described as Antifa far-right protesters clash again in Portland, disrupting peaceful rallies. First of all, there's that word clash again. 
And second of all, this peaceful rally was another Joey Gibson affair, who we've established is a violence troll who can't stop attracting white supremacists like their cat hair. Also, these reports make it sound like Antifa and neo-Nazis were roughhousing with each other, like the Jets and the Sharks, except the Jets believed in ethnic cleansing instead of being a jet all the way. The story describes how Antifa attacked police officers by throwing bottles and rocks. Well, that's not good. It's actually bad. And it's a great way to undermine your own protest. Nine people were arrested and charged with interfering with police officers and disorderly conduct. So justice served, and we can all pack it in, and nope! Buried deeper in the article is this little nugget. A man drove a car into a group of protesters. Luckily, nobody was injured, but it was a close call. People had to jump out of the way as the car accelerated in reverse to target protesters. The article didn't specify whether the man was alt-right, and the only clue we have is that his car was festooned with Confederate flags. So I guess that mystery will never be solved. This has been our new segment, Foreverly Unsolved Mysterious Doings. Well, at least the guy who attempted to murder protesters was arrested like the Antifa people who threw bottles. Wait, what's that? He wasn't? Well, okay, apparently he wasn't arrested. He was detained and then released because purposefully putting your car into reverse to try and mow down protesters is one of those slap on the wrist kinds of things. Yay. And since this was a kind of downer story, here's a bit of fun. After the wannabe terrorist driver was arrested, a group of chuckle nuts called the Proud Boys made an appearance. Now, the Proud Boys described themselves as a pro-Western fraternal organization, AKA Diet Nazi. Though, I prefer Pepsi. Join the conversation. The Proud Boys, apparently cranky that their friend got detained, drove around and blasted pepper spray at protesters from their car. Police stopped them without detaining them because boy Nazis will be boy Nazis. After they were allowed to go, they crashed into a police car. Do we have a clip? Ah, oh, dang. Do we have an audio clip? That's exactly how it sounded. Splendid. Anyways, this story would be even more fun if it wasn't about casual acceptance of low-carb neo-Nazis by police. So let's talk about something cuter. Horses! Well, horseshoe theory at least, which admittedly is less cute, but we'll keep rolling footage of horses being cute and dumb. Aww. Horseshoe theory is the idea that radicals on both sides of the spectrum are the same. Thus, neo-Nazis are somehow the same as the counter-protesters and Antifa who oppose them. This isn't new. There's blame on both sides. Now, further back. My dearest Martha, the battle rages on, and that is no good for me. Weirdly relevant, but too far. I'll just, okay. So, during the civil rights era, politicians equated civil rights activists with the KKK. Dwight D. Eisenhower himself criticized what he called extremists on both sides. If that sounds uncomfortably familiar, we may want to rethink this idea that Donald Trump's awful rhetoric is unprecedented. There was even a headline during the 1950s that said, integration extremists on both sides urged by school head to keep quiet. Remember that old saying about how we definitely shouldn't learn from history so we can keep repeating it because reruns are fun? Recently, the FBI and Department of Homeland Security assessed and labeled Antifa activities as domestic terrorism. Surely there's no historical precedent of the FBI targeting protest movements. Wait, what's that? There totally is? Oh boy. Well, apparently the FBI sent Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. a letter urging him to kill himself. So, remembering this is important, especially now that anti-protester legislation is on the rise. That's right, there are 30 new anti-protest bills that were proposed and six legislatures have approved harsher penalties and fines for protesters. Gasp, our free speech is being suppressed? I'm sure there will be a bunch of far-right think pieces outraged over this. What, there aren't? Cool. Yeah, I know, like, have you seen the show? Jeez. Anyways, Oklahoma just increased sentencing for trespassing, which could now result in six months in jail, as well as property damage as a result of protesting, which could be met with 10 years in jail, which is too long in jail for a person breaking a thing. Some measures are specific, like upgrading the charge against those who block the interstate from gross misdemeanor to a felony, but some are more vague, like anti-loitering bills that give police more freedom in determining whether protests can be classified as unlawful loitering. And maybe we shouldn't be giving too much unchecked power to police, because while some, I assume, are good people, a lot of others are like that cop who tried to illegally collect blood from a patient and detain the nurse who tried to stop his weird cop vampire routine. 
If you think this kind of legislation won't be used by already great judges of the law to clamp down on protesters, it already has. 212 protesters were arrested after anti-Trump inauguration demonstrations, some of whom now face up to 80 years in prison. Even if these people were all guilty of thing damage, this seems excessive. But even their guilt isn't clear. The Office of Police Complaints is reviewing the conduct of the police department during the protests. Lawyers have launched a class action lawsuit that claims police made false arrests and used excessive force. Even journalists were arrested, one of whom is Aaron Cantu, a writer for the Santa Fe Reporter, whose charges don't even include property damage, but merely being present while damage occurred. He faces a possible 75 year sentence. Now look, Property destruction is bad, and sometimes looks extremely dumb. And getting into a fight with police isn't good, but facing life in prison is excessive punishment, especially for someone who may have just been adjacent to the incidents. And for those that were directly responsible for the vehicle damage, broken windows, and an officer's broken wrist, they should face legal consequences, but also, maybe they don't deserve decades in prison? Maybe? People? More valuable than property? Maybe? I don't know, just a thought. Just a thought. On the other side of both sides of violence at protests, remember the guy who tried to drive his car to protesters and how he got off without even being arrested? Republican lawmakers in six states are trying to make it so even if he ended up hitting protesters, he could still be legally protected. Representative Keith Kempenish of North Dakota decided that the water protectors and pipeline protesters were leading too cushy of a life, being legally protected from cars running them over. Protesters who intentionally block and challenge motorists are, quote, the definition of terrorism, according to Kempenich. Running over protesters with a two-ton metal motion machine that can easily pulverize the human skeleton is apparently not terrorism. They just, they just felt challenged, you know, got mad, and used their kill tool to try to kill people. Kempenich isn't alone. Like I said, the Department of Homeland Security has classified Antifa activities as domestic terrorist violence. Compare that to the measures recently taken against far right wing groups, which the SPLC and Anti-Defamation League Center on Extremism say are responsible for the lion's share of extremist related murders and violence. But don't worry, Donald Trump, somehow the president of an entire county, so country, has slashed funding for organizations that fight far right extremism by over $10 million. And according to the SPLC and Anti-Defamation League, far-right extremists are responsible for most of the politically motivated violence in the country. So wait, I thought this was good news. No? Groups that exist to curb the violence of right-wing extremists have lost funding? Good, good, f***ing great, yay, good, yay. So the next time someone says we should be opening dialogue instead of protesting, remember that these effective local outreach programs and nonprofits that sought to target and intervene with extremism have been defanged. Like the, the vampire guy from before. Uh, thanks. To lighten the mood, I want to quote Sir John Jean Jean Paul Jean Paul Seared. The quote comes from 1944's Anti-Semite and the Jew, about anti-Semitism, but broadly it's about hate and where it comes from, and interacting with Nazis or alt-Nazis. Never believe that anti-Semites are completely unaware of the absurdity of their replies. They know that their remarks are frivolous, open to challenge, but they are amusing themselves, for it is their adversary who is obliged to use words responsibly, since he believes in words. The anti-Semites have the right to play. They delight in acting in bad faith, since they seek not to persuade by sound argument, but to intimidate and disconcert. If you press them too closely, they will abruptly fall silent, loftily indicating by some phrase that the time for argument is past. What the Sartre man is saying is that anti-Semites and hate groups such as neo-Nazis, the alt-right, and white nationalists twist the rules of decency and engagement to their advantage. They cry victim while calling for the subjugation or murder of other races. They march in paramilitary gear and carry semi-automatic weapons, then complain about the violence of the left. And when they feel cornered, they rip off their little Nazi polos. I'm not really white power, man. I just came here for the fun. F no. I'm sorry. You can't just take your costume off and refuse to engage with questions. I wish there was a good quote about that. So you just came here for the fun? Never believe that anti-Semites are completely unaware of the absurdity of their replies. Yeah, yeah, so you're not a real white supremacist. They know that their remarks are frivolous, open to challenge. It's kind of a fun idea. Which part? Uh, just being able to say I came in.
but they are amusing themselves, for it is their adversary who is obliged to use words responsibly. I'm not really white power, okay, man, white power. Since he believes in words, the anti-Semites have the right to play. Where's the fun part come? I mean, I was in jail. They delight in acting in bad faith, since they seek not to persuade by sound argument, but to intimidate and disconcert. For what? The time for talk is over. Okay. This is the guy who took his white supremacist uniform off. If you press them too closely... You're a white supremacist until people start chasing you and then you took the uniform off. So are you going to put it back on? Or put it... quite honest. Yeah, yeah. I love to be offensive, it's fun. It's a, so it's like a um, cosplay. They will abruptly fall silent. Loftily indicating by some phrase that the time for argument is past. I don't want to talk. <laughs> Nailed it. Also, okay. yes, that was fun. But what's insidious about this is they get to shed their dumb little shirts, hats, khakis, and tiki torches and blend into society, while the minority targets of their violent rhetoric do not. They know that the media's default setting is even-handedness and civility regardless of context, and they will use that to their advantage. Whenever an Antifa protester throws a punch, they'll use that to justify murder, and they know there will be as much news coverage of the punch or thrown bottle as there will be of the murder, or like 2827. They get to be both victim and victimizer, using our good faith in freedom of speech and laws to continue to push for more mainstream acceptance. So now, we have to keep countering their protests and calling them out on their dog whistle tactics and their lies. At a Berkeley protest of Ben Shapiro, the alt-right spread the news that a woman was stabbed by Antifa, except she fell, and according to the police, there was no stabbing in the city of Berkeley last night. Here's the chairman of Trump Students and Fox News contributor Ryan Fournier spreading the news that here is the Antifa terrorist who was arrested last night with a weapon at Berkeley picture with Hillary Clinton. Wow. I wonder if Hillary gave her that weapon. Oh, the weapon was a sign that she brought to the protest? Cool. Cool? Tweet still up, Ryan? Great, you suck. What was I talking about? Oh, right, it's 2017. Of course I'm talking about Nazis. There are ways to counter Nazis other than punching them, and that starts with the media doing a better job of holding fascists accountable for the crap they do and say, and to actually do research in the groups who claim to be sheep in wolves' clothing. Journalists have a responsibility to look beyond what alt-right and white nationalists brand themselves as and lay bare the fascist violence their rhetoric implies. We can't completely dismiss protesters because some of them are violent, and we can criticize the violence without taking the morally lazy perspective that in terms of fascists and anti-fascists, both sides are equally bad. Wish there was a better way to say that. There's blame on both sides. Nope. Oh, here's a cool life hack for determining which side is worse. Is one of them Nazis? Then it's the Nazis. The Nazis are worse. Life hack. <laughs> Hey everybody, thanks for watching that video. If you want to subscribe to our channel, click the big C in the middle. If you want notifications when we have new videos come out, click the bell icon. And leave a comment that says you didn't watch the video, but it's still wrong. Because it's YouTube.